Hello, ISHR students. This is Mr. Schulte. Um, we are welcome to the next in the video lecture series on the macroeconomic goals. Today's topic is equity in the distribution of income. And uh, this video lecture is meant to, uh, to kind of take the place of your textbook. If you would rather watch the lecture instead of reading, this will cover almost everything you need to know. Um, so listen up and uh, I hope this helps you. Anyway, okay, equity in the distribution of income. You've probably heard people say, you know, you've, just in ongoings or when you're reading the news that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And that the gap, the income gap between the wealthiest in the society and the lowest income is getting more disparate. That basically that this gap is getting worse and worse. Um, this is especially true in developing countries. So um, what, uh, what governments across the world want to do, or should want to do, is try to uh, narrow this gap to make income inequality not quite so disparate or so wide uh, between the rich and the poor. And uh, this is done by kind of help you know by equally or more equally distributing income and and usually creating some sort of middle class um the uh the part of the problem too that's kind of associated with it is that you know people that are in that lower income bracket generally are earning lower wages they have lower living standards um they don't have access to maybe certain types of goods and services within an economy so uh, this is something that, you know, governments will want to correct or improve. Now, the reason why it's called equity in the distribution of income and not equality is because equity has to do with fairness. And we want, governments want equity and not equality in that we want everyone to have a fair or equal chance to succeed. We don't want perfect income equality because this was attempted uh, with the Soviet Union and uh, for a time in, in China under Mao to have perfectly equal income distribution, basically communism. Everybody makes the same amount of money. This did not work. Um, what we found from communism is when we give everybody equal income, all we do is make everybody equally poor. So again, the goal is to have equity in the income distribution, not necessarily, not necessarily equality, but we, we want better equality or more equal distribution, but we don't want perfectly equal. So again, we're trying to create equity or fairness. Um, so again, like we were saying, the goal is equity, not equality. Though when you are writing a paper, if you want to say like we have improved income equality, that, you know, or reduced income inequality, that's okay to say, um, just as long as you don't say we're, we're going for perfect equality. Okay, relative versus absolute poverty. This is an important distinction to understand. Absolute poverty basically occurs when humans don't have the basic necessities for survival. Um, and if you are living on less than a than one dollar and twenty five cents, or you know, this is a, an amount set by the World Bank, if you're living on less than that, you are said to be in absolute poverty. Um, you lack the basic necessities for life. This is. This is a very, very rough set of circumstances for anyone to be in, and usually occurs in uh, LEDCs where we have really, really, um, really, really high levels of income inequality. Relative poverty, on the other hand, occurs when uh, people in a country are poor relative to those around them. So, you know, in countries like Germany or the United States, you know, people there are there is poverty. Poverty exists. But um, people are not starving. People are not lacking certain basic necessities. There are programs like welfare and uh, hot sphere and transfer payments uh, that, that help people out so that they are not completely destitute. Um, so just it's kind of important to remember people in LEDCs um, are more likely to be living in absolute poverty, whereas in MEDCs or more economically developed countries, we are likely to live in relative poverty. But either way, poverty is not desirable. It, it um, really creates a lot of different problems for, for an economy and for a society. Um, and, and this is kind of why we want to improve income inequality or improve 
sorry, reduce income inequality in that we are usually eliminating poverty by improving this uh, as a macroeconomic goal. Okay, you know, one thing that's kind of important to establish, um, and this is again, this is part of the IB standards, is that uh, understanding why, why is it that uh, we have this? Why, where does this income inequality come from? And part of it comes from unequal ownership of the factors of production. Um, you know, that they are things like land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Um, you know, one group or a, a certain group within an economy or within a society generally has more of these uh, or owns more of these factors of production. Um, you know, like a certain group of uh, a certain group of people within a population might, um, a wealthier group might control more land or more entrepreneurship or more capital. Um, and often when these people uh, pass on or die, they transfer that capital or that entrepreneurship, the, the business that they own or the land that they own or the resources they own onto their family. And as the population grows, um, you know, the, basically the, the, the wealthy individuals and families within a society that have retained control of these assets or these factors of production um, are becoming, you know, proportionally more wealthy to the increasing uh, increasing masses of population as the population grows. So this is kind of a problem. So let's look at how do we measure um, income inequality? How do we measure it? We use something called either the Gini index or the Gini coefficient. And we look at this by breaking up any population into quintiles, into fifths. We look at the wealthiest 20%, the next wealthiest 20%, the middle class, the lowest 20%, and finally the poorest 20%. So we're looking at the wealthiest to the least wealthy in, in quintiles or in fifths. And as you can see in this diagram here, this is from the World Bank, that uh, Brazil, the richest 20% of the population control almost 70% of the income. Uh, so they are, you know, we have very unequal income distribution in Brazil. Hungary, comparatively, has, a lot, as you can see, the wealthiest 20% control, you know, not quite half of, of the, uh, of the, I'm sorry, less than half of what Brazil controls, so about 36, or sorry, about half. Anyway, so, but in any effect, you can see that Hungary, control, you know, the wealthiest 20% control 36% of the nation's, or receive 30% of the nation's income as compared to Brazil, where the wealthiest 20% receive a lot more. Um, and so what we can do is we can take this information and we can make a diagram from it. This is called a Lorentz curve. And basically the Lorentz curve um, in this diagram of the green and dotted red curves, and they basically represent the countries, Brazil and Hungary. Um, and you can kind of see how this works. On the y-axis, we have percentage of income, and on the x-axis, we have percentage of the population. So let's take a look at this a little more detail. You can see that the richest 20% would be from 80 to 100. So the richest 80 to 100, uh, the richest 20% control from 100% to almost 35%, well, nearly 70%, of the countries, um, well, so 70% on the y-axis, 70% on the y-axis is controlled by 20% of the population. So this basically shows us that, you know, how unequal the income distribution is. Um, this line here is called the line of absolute equality or perfect equality. And basically how this Lorentz curve works is, you know, by showing that this Brazil's curve here is far away from the line of absolute equality, we, we are showing that Brazil it has very unequal distribution. Whereas Hungary had kind of a better distribution, their Lorentz curve or, Hor or Hungary's Lorentz curve is quite a bit closer to the line of perfect equality or absolute equality. So you can kind of see by looking at this, the, um, the income inequality. The goal of any country would be to try to, you know, move 
this curve inwards to move it closer to the line of perfect equality. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about the Lorentz curve and how we calculate it. So we can figure out based on the set of data and the Lorentz curve, um, we can calculate a number that represents the income inequality in any given country. And we do that by basically using a very simple, um, very simple formula. It's A over A plus B when, if we were doing for, for example, Brazil, everything from to the right, to the left of the green line between the line of absolute equality would be A. This would be A. Everything to the right of the line would be B. And so the formula is A over A plus B would give you the basically the, the Gini coefficient for that country. So again, it's A over A. If this is A and this is B, it's A over A plus B. Anyway, that's how we calculate it. Um, one thing to note about the Gini coefficient and or Gini index, which kind of is the same thing, um, because we want to get close to that line of perfect equality, the closer we get to it, the smaller the number becomes that represents the distance between the Lorentz curve and the line of perfect equality. So um, you can see like on this map, you know, the country that are dark green or light green have pretty low or pretty low Gini coefficient, which is good, meaning income inequality is fairly low in that country. So we have a more equal distribution of income. You can kind of see Norway and Sweden and Denmark have um, really, um, really low Gini coefficients, which mean income inequality is pretty good. So again, the closer the number is to zero, the better it is. Whereas you look at countries in, you know, South America and parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see that the number is higher, right? And that also um, the color is represented by red and it's a higher number. So again, usually the, the Gini coefficient is between zero and one and the closer to zero, the better the uh, indicator is. So next we're gonna talk about taxation. And we're talking about taxation because it's a way with which to correct income inequality. So we, uh, we hope that, uh, you know, the government hopes to sort of correct this by using certain taxes. And there are different types of taxes. Uh, one type of tax is called direct tax, which is a tax on income. There's indirect taxes, which are like sales taxes. They're taxes on expenditure. Capital gains tax, which you pay when you make investment income. Corporate tax, which is taxes on profit and so forth and so forth. There's many different types of taxes, but we're gonna focus on direct taxes or income taxes. Um, most countries have a progressive income tax, which means the percentage paid in tax increases as income rises. So again, as you make more money, the proportion of your income that you pay is larger. Hence, you probably heard the phrase, the more you make, the more they take. Um, a proportional tax, however, would be a flat tax. Um, it's basically a tax where as your income rises, the uh, proportion of income that they take is pretty much the same. Um, and finally, there's a regressive tax, um, which as your income rises, the proportion of, that you pay in tax decreases. So again, these are three types of taxes. A progressive tax helps to improve uh, income equality. Basically, it helps to move our Lorentz curve closer to that line of perfect equality by placing a greater burden on the wealthy than it does on the poor. Uh, and this is due partially um, to uh, a few different things. Um, it's, it has, um, it relates to, sorry, the ability to pay principal. Um, because the wealthier can afford to pay more taxes, they have a greater ability to shoulder that burden than the poor do. You know, if you think about it, the lower income groups, if you take away their income, you, you really hurt their ability to buy goods and services because they don't have that great of ability in the first place to buy many goods and services. One thing that often economists, though, kind of cite uh, in reference to this is um, something called the Laffer curve, um, which is this diagram here on the uh, right. And the reason why is uh, we, we talk about 
the Laffer curve in relation to progressive taxes is because um, we want to be careful. If we raise taxes too much, this can this can hurt the economy. It can act as a disincentive to work hard. I mean, if you keep raising and raising taxes on the wealthy, um, they may want to leave the country or they may not want to work as hard, and that's not good. So this curve here shows two things. We have tax rate and we have tax revenue. As the tax rate increases, the tax revenue also increases. But there is a point that we reach that if we increase taxes beyond that point, and it's a non-defined point, um, that's why it's two question marks here. If we raise it beyond that point, actually our revenue starts to go down. Um, there, it's kind of a disincentive to work hard, hard, harder and earn more because the government's taking so much of your money that you know you don't really want to work harder at that point. Um, and also, um, you know, the government taking so much money frees up or takes up the money that would be used for for consumption and for investment. And you know, it's it's you know you have to be careful how high you place your tax rates. So again, sort of a counter argument to progressive taxes, or at least something you could mention in relation to it, is the Laffer curve and the need to be careful on how high you raise those progressive tax rates. Just a few other die ideas um, for correcting income inequality. Another idea is transfer payments. Uh, these are things like welfare, like HOTSFIA, unemployment benefits. Um, these go to usually lower income groups within a within a, an economy, and um, this you know helps to reduce income inequality because you know people on welfare they're receiving a little bit of money. Um, hopefully, they're out of poverty or at least um, having a lower level of poverty than they would uh, if they didn't have those benefits. So again, this helps to shift the Lawrence curve inward and promote income or, or reduced income inequality. Um, also, we can subsidize things like education. You know, if you think about it, education is the great equalizer. By allowing people to get educated, they can get out of poverty, they can get a better wage, a better job, and so uh, education uh, as well as healthcare help to move the Lawrence curve inward and improve, you know, income equality or reduced or rather equity in the income distribution. Finally, um, a new uh, kind of uh, thing in, within the world of economics, a, an economist named Thomas Piketty, uh, a French economist, recently wrote a book that was a New York Times bestseller called Capital in the 21st Century. And he argues in this book that another thing that could help improve uh, the whole problem of income inequality, um, improve the situation with regard to it, is to uh, have to tax the assets of the wealthy, to basically, um, you know, to, you know, we are taxing the, the wealthy already at a higher rate, but that if we tax their assets, which are, you know, not taxes maybe as much as they should be, um, this will help to improve income inequality. Um, and we'll talk more about this in class. It's kind of an interesting theory. Um, but again, if you could cite him in your paper and mention the idea of taxing the assets of the wealthy, um, that would be kind of, you know, kind of make, make it seem like you're kind of on the cutting edge of new economic theory. Anyway, I hope this helps. And, um, you know, just a quick, quick lesson on equity and in the income distribution. Um, what does it refer to? What are the problems created by unequal income? How do we represent it with the diagram? And how do we correct it? Um, please uh, watch this video uh, as many times as you'd like. It's, uh, it's a resource for you to help you learn the material. All right, good luck and see you tomorrow.